everybody. I'm really, really happy and even, uh, I, can, I may say, excited to be here. So, th uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Genevieve and Steve and all of your team uh, for inviting me. Uh, as I already mentioned, I think it's a, a unique initiation and I truly believe this is the way you heard that before also from uh, other speakers uh, this morning and yesterday, I, I believe, I really, really think there is su a, such an important work that all of us uh, should do together. Us, I mean, meaning uh, researchers on one side and um, people with uh, such a precious uh, experience as you, teachers, and only uh, together we can really improve uh, uh, the way we teach our students, no matter uh, what age they are. So, um, what we're going to do together, uh, I'd like us to uh, have a, a meaningful journey in the realm of uh, attention. And this is a tough, a tough uh, uh, aim, a tough goal, and I really, really, uh, I'll try to do my best so that you won't be exhausted <laughs> on the way. But admittedly, uh, it's going to be a bit tough. Let's see how we're going to uh, do it together. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with a brief background on ADHD. Um, I'll talk about uh, both cognitive and neural correlates of ADHD. We'll, uh, I'll emphasize how challenging it is to uh, precisely assess attention deficits. Um, and then I'll try to convince you that all of us, including uh, teachers and other professionals who work with uh, children with uh, all sorts of uh, difficulties, must understand um, the basic mechanisms that are underlying uh, our ability to learn. And then in the second part, I'll uh, focus on cognitive training, uh, I think, he, uh, and also not just, not just uh, by introducing uh, several uh, studies that uh, are being conducted in my lab uh, back uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, but also I'll try to integrate and to um, uh, come up with a list of tools that hopefully you will be able to take from here today by the end of my presentation. This is my, my goal, at least. Okay, so let's start. Ah, sorry, I should use this. So first of all, we're, we're talking about ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is one of the most, uh, uh, of the highly frequent Oh, sorry, now you see it also. It's one of the most frequently diagnosed childhood uh, disorder. Um, it is a neurobehavioral disorder considered to be caused by specific brain dysfunction. We'll talk a, a little bit uh, uh, later what exactly it means. Uh, it is characterized by symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention uh, beginning in, uh, during uh, childhood. Um, most importantly, we should be aware of the fact that, that ADHD rarely comes on its own. Usually, it is accompanied by other psychopathologies, uh, and this is again a great challenge to be able to disentangle the different difficulties that the learner is coping with. So that's a very, very um, problematic uh, uh, um, character, the fact that ADHD is usually uh, accompanied by uh, other, um, other disorders, okay, other uh, psychopathologies. Now, it is really, really important to be aware of the fact that uh, in the last uh, DSM, DSM is the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual, the manual that defines all psychopathologies, including ADHD. So the last v version, the DSM-5, was published uh, on 2013, six years ago already. And uh, one of the important uh, uh, um, changes that were introduced in the DSM-5 related to ADHD is that uh, instead of uh, um, uh, being uh, part of the... Um, behavioral problems section, now it is ADHD is related to 
uh, neurobehavioral and developmental disorders. This is a really, really substantial change in the way, uh, hopefully, the uh, society treats attention. Not just ba uh, badly behaving children or students, but children or individuals who cope with neurobehavioral developmental disorder. This is uh, um, uh, an important uh, change. Now, um, according to the DSM-5, there are three uh, presentations, not, not uh, subtypes anymore, as it used to be, but they, use the, they now use the term presentation, presentations, and I think it, uh, it reflects the fact that the diagnosis is not stable across development. Uh, but I'll, um, let me just uh, mention the three presentations. To, so the first one is uh, predominantly inattentive, uh, and uh, it is uh, called ADHD, um, IA, inattention. And now let's see, um, just a minute, let, let's see the symptoms. So, has poor attention to details, makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, homework, or other activities, has difficulty in sustaining attention, does not appear to listen when spoken to directly, does not follow instructions or finish tasks, has difficulty organizing tasks and activities, avoids or dislikes tasks that require sustained mental effort, and loses things necessary for tasks or activities. There should be another one, I suppose, yes. Is easily distracted. Now, I'd like you uh, to have uh, another look at this list and focus on it for, for uh, 10 seconds and think uh, about how familiar you are with this, uh, this list of symptoms. I believe, I don't know, I want to talk about you, but I can, I can uh, tell you uh, uh, how I see it. These symptoms are quite familiar to me as a mother, as a teacher of a higher education student, as a, a, a partner, etc., etc., etc. I can, I can experience these, these symptoms myself, okay? It depends when and how badly. I can uh, experience these uh, symptoms, but what I would like to emphasize is that it's not something which is really, really weird, okay? It's not something uh, which is uh, very specific to um, an extreme case of whatever disorder, okay? This is one of our challenges. The fact that these symptoms are familiar to most of us, uh, if not for all of us. Now, Back to the uh, list of presentations. So the first one is, is, a, a, is attention disorder, which is uh, characterized by this list of symptoms of inattention. The second presentation, called predominantly hyperactive impulsive, ADI, ADHD HI for hyperactive impulsive. And let's have a look on the symptoms here. Fidgets with hands or feet, feet or squirms in seat leaves seat when expected to remain there, runs about excessively and inappropriately, has difficulty in playing quietly, is on the go, talks excessively, blurts out answers before the question is complete, cannot wait for his or her turn, interrupts or intrudes on others. Oops, and I uh, forgot that that was the last one. So again, sorry. Just a minute. Hmm? Sorry about that. Again, what I'd like to emphasize, I don't know how it is here in, in Canada, in this country, but at least uh, where I come from, again, these list of symptoms, the symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, are again symptoms that we meet uh, in every classroom, in every preschool, uh, in, uh, in almost every home, uh, and environment. So uh, here too, these symptoms are uh, very familiar. We see it uh, uh, too often, I should say, and perhaps it's a matter of uh, a social thing. Uh, so perhaps it's completely different uh, in other countries. And the third uh, uh, presentation is the combined uh, 
uh, presentation, uh, which means the individu individuals who show both inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms, and the, uh, this presentation is called ADHD combined. Okay, now a technical um, uh, clarification, please keep uh, in mind that when we say, not, not only us, but this is, a, this is the uh, scientific uh, also community who share this, so when we do, when we say ADHD, we mean any of the presentations, even if they don't include the age, the hyperactivity or impulsivity, okay? So we are talking about all sorts of presentations of, of the disorder, okay? It is a bit uh, confusing, but uh, speaking about uh, uh, cognitive control, but that's, that's what it means. Now, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, share with you the, um, uh, several major pitfalls uh, when diagnosing ADHD, and I already led to, uh, to, to uh, one of them. So, uh, perhaps uh, um, the most problematic thing is that the, these two lists of behavioral symptoms could actually be the result of many, many, many different causes. Uh, that is to say that the definition of ADHD lacks specificity. It's not the only disorder that suffers from this problem, but uh, because of the fact that ADHD is so um, uh, often diagnosed, then it, it really, uh, this is a, a really, really major uh, problem. So, uh, NIG, many years ago, already uh, um, uh, defined or uh, phrased this problem as symptoms sharing uh, with other disorders uh, and other difficulties, not just uh, disorders. So, how are we going to cope with uh, this problem? One of the, of the ways to try and better understand and better be able to assess whether or not these symptoms the symptoms that we just, uh, I just uh, showed you uh, are the results of ADHD. Um, uh, there's a trend uh, for many years now of importing neuropsychological paradigms to the field of ADHD. Um, I'll give you uh, examples later on. And uh, it means that gradually more and more uh, very, very um, well-studied paradigms, cognitive paradigms and neuropsychological paradigms uh, were brought to the field of ADHD. However, this um, uh, trend or movement uh, uh, unraveled that ADHD is a complex disorder. Uh, that is, uh, multiple neural networks and multiple um, cognitive mechanisms are involved in ADHD. So there's no single neuropsychological a mechanism or a component that could, uh, that could uh, underlie and could explain um, the case of ADHD. It means that the diagnosis process is still, um, is still an open um, challenge because there's no single, there's no blood test for ADHD, okay? Blood, blood test, so to speak. Um, so this is perhaps uh, one of the first lessons I'd like you to take uh, uh, from here, that we are talking, we are dealing with a heterogeneous disorder. It means that if a, one child looks uh, um, uh, unattended, inattentive, uh, easily distracted, um, in terms of uh, he's, he's very, very uh, uh, uneasy, is really, really moving uh, uh, in, in his seat and all over the classroom, etc., etc. Uh, there's no single attention, even if it is a, uh, attention uh, disorder, ADHD, even if it is, it is the case, uh, we don't know yet which cognitive mechanism or, in other words, which attention function okay, or, or aspect or network is involved in his case, his or her case. Now, um, so there's a huge literature of, uh, um, of studies uh, that are uh, investigating many, many, many questions in ADHD, uh, both neuropsychological and brain imaging studies. Uh, among, among this uh, huge number of studies, we can say that uh, the most consistent impairments uh, of ADHD are deficits in sustained attention, our ability to stay focused over a long period of time, especially when we are um, involved in very, very simple and monotonous skills and tasks, 
or activities. And the other thing is cognitive control, again, directly related to what we heard this morning. Um, and when I'm saying cognitive uh, control, I'll refer to two components of cognitive control. One is, a response in, is response inhibition, or more specifically, inhibition of a prepotent response. Uh, response instincts, okay, responses that are very well learned and that we are, we are really, really uh, got used to, to perform. And the other one is interference control, uh, and this is more to, uh, to do with the, the examples that we heard this morning about these tricky questions, um, the situations where we have to overcome the obvious, overcome the, uh, our instincts or the more salient aspect of the, of the uh, question or of the um, uh, activity or whatever, and to be able to uh, retrieve the right uh, response. So these are two, two mechanisms that I'd like to elaborate on. Uh, and here I'd like uh, another semantic clarification, uh, because in the literature, not only of ADHD, um, different, different terms are uh, being used interchangeably, so don't, mix, don't, don't, don't be, try not to be confused. So con cognitive control, executive attention, executive functions, and, and surely there are uh, other terms as well. We are talking about the same thing, okay? Control. Uh, abilities, control, processes that uh, are really important when we are dealing in more complex um, tasks. Now, talking about neural correlates of ADHD, so surely ADHD, uh, again, for quite a long time now, uh, is a very, very attractive, attractive field for brain imaging researchers. And literally, you can find in the literature uh, differences uh, uh, between uh, individuals with ADHD and uh, control participants, what we call neurotypical uh, participants, in uh, literally uh, almost every single uh, area of the brain. So again, it's not, it's not too uh, helpful. Um, and this is something, again, uh, to, to be aware of. So not, not every single... Uh, study that you are exposed to uh, can tell you the entire st story, so be aware of that. Now, uh, having said that, I, I will mention that ab abnormalities uh, in the basal ganglia, prefrontal structures, and the corpus callosum have, uh, have been the most consistently reported uh, findings across studies, but as I said before, many other areas were also shown to be uh, impaired or to uh, function differently in individuals with ADHD. Um, okay, so I, another thing I'd like to say, because I'm going to present one, one uh, brain imaging study from, uh, from my lab, uh, so I, I'd like to mention that one of the important things that, uh, um, that were done during, for sure, for, for the last decade and even more than that, is uh, studies that were able to relate between brain activities and functional performance. Okay, so it's not enough that I'm showing, or whoever, uh, uh, other researchers show that uh, individuals with ADHD are, uh, find it much more difficult to inhibit a response. Uh, uh, on a different study, and on another study, uh, it, is be, it is been reported that uh, IFG, inferior frontal gyrus, uh, is activated uh, um, um, weekly, uh, I mean, uh, less activated during a response inhibition task. It's not, it's not enough. We really uh, uh, should try and correlate between these aspects being able to relate the brain mechanism, the brain network, the brain abnormalities, and the cognitive uh, mechanism that we believe, and not just believe, we have to, to uh, prove that, uh, uh, that the, brain the cognitive mechanism is related to the everyday difficulties that uh, students with ADHD are coping with. You see what I'm saying? So there's a, a, an entire chain uh, that should be uh, somehow related between the brain, uh, the brain imaging or the brain mechanism, the neuropsychological uh, construct or mechanism, and the behavior, the everyday functioning. 
Um, for sure, we need uh, many more um, longitudinal studies uh, that uh, will uh, enable us to, uh, to investigate two things. First of all, the important uh, effect of development, because uh, as you heard and uh, we all know, there are vast changes throughout, uh, throughout development in both uh, uh, brain maturity and cognitive and psychological uh, uh, mechanisms. And obviously the, the demands that uh, dif different, I mean, students in different ages are uh, exposed to. Also, there's a, an open question. We'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, a medical doctor, okay? But of course, obviously, I, I won't refrain from the huge issue around uh, pharmacological treatments. So that's another very important question uh, to be able to better understand the effects of uh, um, uh, psychostimulants uh, most, in most cases, in the case of ADHD, and how it affects uh, both brain uh, activation and uh, again all the chain all the way so brain activation neuropsychological functioning and everyday performance in all sorts of uh, settings okay so now i'd like to uh, briefly present a, a study that was uh, conducted in uh, my lab by uh, who is now dr tamar kolodny uh, Tamar was interested in uh, being able to identify uh, the brain areas that are closely related to response inhibition um, and, and to do that not only can... What should I do? This way? Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, not only uh, being able to identify the brain areas uh, that are um, specifically related uh, uh, to response inhibition, but also to uh, investigate um, and to compare uh, higher education students uh, with ADHD compared to neurotypical students. So Tamar used a, a paradigm that we uh, developed. I mean, uh, in many, many studies, the tasks that are being used to assess uh, response inhibition is a go-no-go -no -go task. Um, so what we are using, we developed in, in a lab a simple task, but uh, such that will involve attention. So one of the problems with uh, importing neuropsychological tasks and tools to the field of ADHD is, uh, is the, the problem of being... Um, of confusing all sorts of uh, cognitive um, components. So in our task, we're really doing our best to isolate response inhibition and not to overload on working memory and perceptual um, demands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you'll have a look uh, up here, you'll see on the left side, you see here, the target is a red square. And the red square appears, uh, I mean, each each uh, shape appears very, very briefly uh, for uh, 100 milliseconds or so, and th there are four, uh, four possible shapes and four possible um, colors, and only when a red square uh, appears, then the, particip the participant uh, is asked to, to press uh, the space bar as, soon as, he, as, as fast as he can, but he has to be as accurate as he can. As you can see here, if you imagine that you would have uh, done this task, most of the time you have to press on the space bar. Okay, so we produce a ten, um, response bias towards pressing the space bar, and then when a ra rare uh, distractor comes up, then you really have to inhibit your prepotent response. Okay, so that's here on the left. Whoops, there. Where is it? Here. Okay. However, look here in this series of, of stimuli. Now, here you can see that only the, uh, re the red square is rarely presented. So here you're doing the very same task. You still have to perform to respond to a red square. However, now you should sit still and just wait patiently enough, uh, focused enough, uh, to the red square to appear. So now it's, uh, the, the, your state of mind is completely different. You have to be uh, aware not to fall asleep, 
okay? But it shouldn't be a big problem. It's still, it's, it still demands response inhibition because you still have to, you, you have to watch out and not to respond to the, to the red the triangle there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the demands, we can compare the magnitude of, uh, of response inhibition demands, right? In this condition here, in the rare no-go compared to the prevalent no-go. This is a very, very important comparison because if we would like to really isolate uh, brain uh, uh, areas that are specifically involved in, in the inhibition of a prepotent response, the control condition, the condition to which we compare the, the, our investigation should be as similar as possible. And, uh, and if, you can, if you can see what I'm uh, showing here, it's the very same uh, task, but the cognitive demands are completely different in terms of response inhibition. Okay. So we, um, so we um, compared, as I just mentioned, um, these two conditions. Okay, so we are focusing on the response inhibition condition, and in uh, brain imaging studies, we, as, as I mentioned, this is really, really important to compare two different uh, conditions and to make sure or to do uh, um, uh, and to make efforts that only the mechanism that you are interested in that will be the, the big difference between the two conditions. And here are the behavioral results. You can see here, I'll walk you through this table. So we, we have here, whoops, uh, mean reaction time. So that refers to the, uh, only to the target uh, stimuli, okay? Whenever a red square appeared and the participant respond uh, correctly. And you can see here the comparison, you see here, neurotypical here, uh, this is the condition where most of the stimuli were no-go, okay? So you can see that it's, it's slower compared to the uh, condition where most of the stimuli were go trials. And this is exactly what we expect. This is the response uh, bias I was uh, referring to uh, earlier. You can see the neurotypical performance and you can see the ADHD performance. So similar effect, but slower overall, okay? Uh, another important measure in a uh, go-no-go task is commission errors, what we call false alarms, okay? When we respond to a non-target, to a distractor, because these, these are um, examples of failure of response inhibition, okay? So to, be, to, to confirm that indeed we created the conditions we were looking for, we expect to have more commission errors in this condition here compared to this condition here, okay? Because here, it was really uh, difficult to refrain from a, from a response when a rare distractor com comes up. So again, you can see a clear effect in the neurotypical participants and also in the ADHD uh, group, okay? Same conditions, similar to here, but more pronounced, okay? So they make more mistakes, and this is what we expect them to do also, uh, also uh, based on previous studies, not only with us, with the, our task, but with the uh, different versions of the task. Now, in terms of brain imaging, in, uh, brain imaging data, it was really, really uh, interesting because in these tasks, um, in many previous ta uh, studies that used different go-no-go -no -go tasks, uh, the most consistent result was act different in the activation in uh, prefrontal areas and the uh, IFG, as I mentioned before, the inferior frontal gyrus. And here, what we found, uh, first of all, I'll talk about the, um, uh, the neurotypical. You see it here, whoops, here um, on the left side. So in the, uh, in, in the neurotypical cohort, we found, when we compared these two conditions, and we, uh, we were focusing on the, uh, on the response inhibition component, we found, um, uh, we found uh, 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 significant effects in the IPS and in the uh, temporal parietal junction, which are areas in the parietal cortex and not the frontal uh, cortex. And, and we think this is due to the fact that we uh, compared the, uh, the mere 
the, we compared condition between the, the high frequent and the uh, low frequent uh, uh, no go, um, and we think that's that's why we managed to be much more specific in terms of the activa activations we found. The, these activations were uh, in the uh, in the condition where we compared the highly frequent no goes with the low frequent uh, no goes. Now, very, very surprisingly, I mean, it depends where, from what, what point of view you are looking at it, but uh, in, the, in the ADHD group, there were no differences between these two conditions. So, uh, individuals with ADHD use the, or activate to the same level these areas, and they are not uh, uh, influenced by the changing in the task demands. Okay? However, and this is the last part I'm going to uh, mention here, however, what we found with the ADHD uh, participants uh, in this slide here is that the magnitude of the difference in this area, in the activation uh, of the IPS, among the other things, uh, among the other areas, was correlated to the severity of symptoms. Okay, so individuals who uh, reported high ADHD symptoms were, uh, were, weren't showing the effect of task demand, okay? So they weren't able to activate these spe specific areas, whereas individuals with ADHD with low symptoms, relatively low, relatively to their uh, peers, they showed the effect, a similar effect to the effect we got uh, in, the, um, in the neurotypical group. So, that was a, um, a very interesting, and, and uh, we, we expected, we looked for the IPS uh, uh, activities, but as I said before, you can really, in the literature, you can get lost and uh, be very, very um, uh, confused with uh, everything you see there. Okay, so, um, five minutes. Okay. All right, so, um, just to wrap it up uh, together until now, what I'd like you to, um, uh, to try uh, and, uh, and uh, be convinced is that in order to uh, really um, assess precisely the uh, core mechanism that drive the behavioral problems, not just the, sim the ADHD symptoms, but also the uh, uh, everyday functioning, we really have to um, um, get a better understanding, oops, a better understanding, sorry, just a minute, just a minute, sorry about that, okay, is it still okay? So we, we must have a better understanding of the attention and the cognitive system. And uh, only then we can come up with sensitive assessment uh, tools that will en enable us to uh, come up with an individual attention profile for each student, for, uh, no matter what age they are. And that will allow us to uh, better adjust tailor-made treatments and protocols. Because one of the um, problematic issues with ADHD is that we are lacking and non-pharmacological efficient treatments. And this is, again, a big, big uh, uh, goal uh, for uh, many of the researchers in the field of ADHD, because even when a child can benefit from ph pharmacological treatment, it seldom uh, produces uh, an entire solution for his or her uh, various difficulties. Okay, so now what I'm going to do together with you is to present um, a multifaceted um, uh, view of attention. Uh, if we, if, if, uh, we will think about how attention was uh, treated uh, 
uh, many decades ago, uh, I can quickly, I mean, there are a huge number of uh, attention researchers, obviously, but, uh, but what was uh, similar to uh, all the researchers in the early days, I'm talking about uh, over uh, 40 years ago now, um, attention was treated as a unitary construct. So different theories focused on, uh, pr um, perhaps on, on different uh, uh, meaning of attention, but all of them um, really treated attention as a unitary concept. So it, it, either I'm good at attention or I'm not. Uh, only later on, uh, starting uh, by the 19th of, uh, of the last century, uh, other models uh, started to, uh, to develop, and these mod models, I, I uh, call them uh, multifaceted models of attention. What, uh, what is important for us uh, to, to understand is that these models treat attention as a multifaceted uh, construct, which means it's not only a single ability, it's not that I'm uh, only good at attention and then it means I'm, I'll be able to uh, use whatever attentional resources I need, but this is a much more complicated thing. Uh, another important thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that, uh, again, unlike um, several decades ago, we now understand that attention is a key factor, not only in the sense of, um, in the context of academic learning, but also uh, for all other, other aspects of, of learning, social learning, emotional uh, functioning, etc., etc. So that means we should be even more uh, motivated to treat attention, to understand our our students' uh, attentional um, uh, strengths and weaknesses, so that we will be better understand their difficulties and the paths of that can really help them. So uh, I'm going to briefly present the framework we are working with, uh, together with uh, my colleagues. This is a version of a model that was presented uh, uh, in 1990 by Posner and uh, Peterson and their colleagues, uh, uh, and back then it was a very, very novel and still is a, a highly uh, cited and influential uh, model. Um, so we did the adjustment uh, for ADHD, and we are talking about four different attention functions. The first, one, the first attention function is sustained attention, and here we are referring to our ability to stay focused over a long period of time. What you are doing yesterday and today, you are really, really challenging uh, your uh, sustained attention. Although, let's, let's uh, um, say that uh, you are here because you are really highly motivated to broaden your understanding, etc., etc., which is true, but still, you, have, you really have to put a lot of effort in terms of sustained attention, okay? Because you're sitting e here relatively passive, in a passive way, that loads a huge burden on sustained attention. Think about it uh, in the context of your classrooms, okay? Your students. And the problem would, would be exact, especially when the, when the tasks that we are involved uh, in are monotonous, simple, very well known. Okay? The other thing is selective spatial attention, and let me emphasize here that different researchers will use similar term, uh, but uh, in different meanings. So even, even today, this morning, uh, Grégoire used the term selective attention, and he meant something else. I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. I'm using here a similar term, watch out, selective spatial attention. Actually, you did, re you did relate to this uh, meaning when I'm thinking about it, so that's, the, the, that's an, uh, an example of the same meaning. Uh, the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning spatial attention is that the, it relates to our ability to zoom in, okay, focus our, our attention resources, our atten attentional spotlight, to a very restricted visual area, spatial, not visual, spatial area, okay? Think about uh, when a young reader, um, not, not a fluent reader, when he has to read um, um, a paragraph, okay? That's very, very challenging in terms of selective spatial attention, because he has to focus on a restricted spatial area uh, and being able to 
uh, ignore, to, to inhibit adja adjacent destructors. Okay? Is this, uh, is this okay? All right. So that's a second function of, uh, of attention. Another, yet another function of attention uh, is orienting attention. And here I'm referring to our ability to shift attention from one, um, one point in our visual uh, field to another. So I'm looking at uh, you there, Steve, and when I would like to, uh, to shift my attention somewhere else, I'll have to disentangle from this location, shift all the way uh, up there, uh, being able to focus on Genevieve. These uh, shifts, uh, engagement and disengagement, should be really, really precise and careful so that I'll be efficient in what I'm doing. Uh, again, these two, two functions are highly, highly re relevant uh, for academic skills, basic academic skills, uh, reading, writing, math, etc., etc. Et now, the fourth function of attention is the executive attention, uh, which is the cognitive control, uh, as we heard uh, this morning. And here, I already mentioned, I'm talking about the ability to inhibit a prepotent response, a response that we are really, really familiar and very, very uh, skillful with, uh, but yet, sometimes it, it will mislead us that rather than help us. And the other component I'm uh, focusing on is our ability uh, to resolve conflicts, conflicts and to adjust our behavior to uh, changes in the environment. Okay? Um, now, we are towards the end of the, uh, of the first part, and I'd like to take one minute uh, of reflection, and please write down uh, one idea um, which is related to how the different attention functions that we just um, uh, quickly, uh, that I just quickly described, how these different attention functions are involved in our everyday functioning. You can think about even one, uh, one of the functions, you can um, think about more than one, so please take one minute and write it down for you. Okay, I, I, if, I ca if I should uh, judge according to the level of activity, <laughs> then, then I assume you, you finished. Uh, what I'd like to do before we finish this part, and before I'll take questions, uh, I'd like to show you um, um, results of uh, one of our previous studies where we compared kids, these are uh, elementary school kids with ADHD, and we compared here, the, uh, on, the, on your left, you see the ADHD from the inattentive uh, presentation, uh, uh, compared to the ADHD combined. Uh, I'm reminding you that ADHD combined referred to children that suffer from both inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. And the important thing I'd, I'd like to show here is, okay, so ADHD combined, you can see, these are the frequencies of the deficit, uh, referring to the four functions of attention I just mentioned, okay? So, if we will focus on the ADHD combined group, we can see, and the numbers are, are relatively small, we should mention, I should mention that, but you can very clearly see that uh, literally uh, almost all the uh, ADHD combined uh, kids suffered from sustained attention difficulties. This is not surprised, perhaps, but what is more important uh, from my point of view, that you can see that over half of them also suffered from other attention difficulties. So it's not only uh, the problem of being focused and stay fo maintain attention over a long period of time when, the, when tasks are monotonous and, and not interesting enough, so to speak, but also many of them suffer from the other aspects, the other functions of attention, okay? And we, uh, if we'll have another look here, on the uh, ADHD inattentive, you can see that here the picture is a bit different because the most uh, frequent impaired function is selective spatial attention rather than, uh, rather than uh, sustained attention. Uh, but also here you can see that about a third of the participants also suffered from the other, one of the other 
um, attention difficulties. And I, let me just mention that selective spatial, spatial attention is not um, referred to not in the symptoms of the, uh, uh, of the um, DSM, uh, the definition of ADHD, but also not in none of the uh, diagnosis uh, uh, tests I'm familiar with, either in clinical um, uh, settings or even in uh, research contexts. Um, so I know I'm, I have to uh, stop here, but let me just show you this last uh, finding from another study that was uh, conducted in, in my lab uh, several years ago. Here, what we've done here, that was a, a study that uh, invest, investigated the role of sustained attention in reading, comprehension, in reading and reading comprehension. Okay? These were adolescents, and what uh, you can see here, uh, we, we included in this study a group of uh, adolescents with ADHD, and a group of adolescents without ADHD, neurotypical uh, adolescents, and we assessed their sustained attention in the in the task in the go no go no go task task that I uh, described earlier. And what we've done, you can see here, here you can see you. We divided the entire sample to three uh, subgroups. So these are the good sustained attention uh, adolescents. Here are the medium sustained attention adolescents, whoops, and the poor sustained attention adolescents, okay? And now we compared their performance on reading and reading comprehension tasks. The, the tasks were ecological, they were the texts were taken from a um, history book, and the exams were open uh, questions, so they really, and they knew it in, in advance that they'll have to read. Uh, silent reading, and then, but they knew in advance that they'll have to uh, answer open questions. And see what we found here. So good sustained attention um, uh, adolescents performed uh, the best in terms of all three uh, aspects. They were, they managed to produce more correct answers compared to the medium group and the poor sustained attention group. They, uh, they, their reading duration was faster compared to the other two groups, and their reading comprehension errors were the lowest compared to the other um, two uh, sustained attention groups. And I'd like to emphasize that it's not only the effect of good versus poor, but also the medium, okay? So it's not... It's not that only, poor sustain only individuals with poor sustained attention will suffer in a very, very common task like reading and reading comprehension, but also the ones in the middle. And that again relates uh, our discussion here um, and broaden it. It's not only the kids that are, who are diagnosed or not diagnosed with ADHD. Actually, the attention play, attention, generally speaking, plays a major role for everybody, okay? So, with this, I'm, I'm going to end here, and I think it will, it will um, help me to uh, convince you why we should be really motivated to try and train attention so that uh, all of us students will be uh, more efficient in our, re uh, our learning. I'll stop here and I'll let you uh, ask several questions. Okay. So, we're now... Uh, I'll now turn to talk about uh, attention training or cognitive training, uh, referring obviously to the case of individu individuals with ADHD. I'll start with... Uh, Oops. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I'll start, start with a brief background. And as you uh, may uh, uh, know and be aware of the fact that uh, in, during the rec recent years, uh, there's ha there has been a growing interest in, in the implications of neuroscience to education and learning. That's one of uh, the reasons why I really think this uh, summer school is such a, an important and, and uh, needed, highly timely and needed thing. Um, 
So there's many, many commercial uh, softwares out there, but unfortunately, many of them are very far from being uh, scientific, scientifically uh, validated and theory driven. And uh, in order to really, not just to develop, but also to use these, these softwares, I think educators and teachers really have, uh, really need the ability to understand and to be critical enough to to judge and to ask uh, important questions before they uh, integrating uh, this software, software or another, or this uh, game or activity or another. Um, now, it is uh, uh, important to mention that uh, we do have, and relating, uh, relating to the question that I've been asked uh, earlier, so we have all sorts of uh, evidence supporting uh, the claim that uh, many, of the, many of the cognitive uh, um, uh, mechanisms uh, that are uh, serving as uh, basis for, for uh, uh, academic uh, activities and academic skills can be trained. However, this is really, really tricky, and it's not simple enough. Uh, it's not simple at all, and we should be really careful and aware of the pitfalls and and the hopeful uh, aspects. Um, another important thing is the plasticity nature of the brain, of the human brain. Um, that's uh, we have plenty of evidence for that. So if you if you are using a very very structured protocol. Uh, of whatever you would like to train, you'll be able to, and, the, and again, you, you heard it uh, earlier uh, this morning, uh, we should be able to, uh, to measure uh, uh, changes in brain activity. Now, it's not only the, the changes in brain activity we are looking for, we are really looking for changing, changes in uh, in performance, okay, and not only uh, lab tasks, but everyday uh, uh, performance in everyday activities. This is our huge aim. Um, another important aspect of the uh, human brain is uh, the uh, specificity of certain areas. So it's not like uh, many years ago, uh, researchers thought or claimed that there's this very specific area in the brain that is uh, involved in reading. We now know that it's much more than one single area, and we are talking about networks, uh, etc., etc., and also um, the relations between uh, um, uh, brain areas. So the, the picture is much more complicated, yet we do know that there, there are um, areas in the brain that are specialized in very specific uh, type of uh, processing. So that's another encouraging thing to, um, to count on. Now, as to the motivation and the theoretical rationale of attention training in the case of ADHD, as I already um, mentioned, um, since ADHD is characterized uh, by various attention and cognitive difficulties, I focused on attention, but there are many other studies that also show other cognitive uh, impairments. Uh, uh, so, one way or another, if we know ADHD is, is a disorder that is related, and again, that's uh, uh, back to the, the first question back there, up there, so if we know there is a real uh, basis, um, not, not a single one, but there are several uh, cognitive impairments in ADHD, then the theoretical rationale is there. So if we will be able to train uh, different, different aspects or functions of attention or different co cognitive components that are related to the everyday um, challenges of students with ADHD, then uh, successful training should be translated to everyday functioning, okay? That's the theoretical um, framework. Um, and in terms, and more specific, specifically, when we talk about attention, sustained attention and cognitive control, uh, we really have, there is a solid, um, basis to believe 
that it should boost attention. Okay? Now again, this is, uh, this, all of this is the theoretical rationale. We still have to support it empirically. And this is a difficult mission. A difficult, but I, I would or, I'll say already, I believe it is possible to do that. Okay, so that's what we uh, just said. Uh, so that's our main goal, our main issue, and let's see what I can uh, say about that. So first of all, I mentioned it very briefly uh, earlier. Um, so uh, when talking, when thinking about ADHD, individuals with ADHD, even now, 2019, the most effective treatment to ADHD, uh, whether we like it or not, are psychostimulants, okay? Pharmacological treatment, uh, that's the most effective treatment. However, it, it, it should be noted that this treatment is far from being um, comprehensive, and not to mention the fact that approximately 30% and sometimes more than that of the indivi individuals who suffer from ADHD cannot benefit from psychostimulants. For, uh, for one reason or another. So there is a real need to come up with non-pharmacological treatment, okay? Um, now, talking about cognitive training in, in the context of ADHD, so there were and there still are um, uh, different uh, approaches to cognitive training. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these studies, studies suffer from several very major pitfalls. One, one of them is, and this is again not, not specific to ADHD, but we are dealing now uh, with ADHD. So the first one is, the first weaknesses is the um, uh, problematic uh, designs, methodological designs. In order to be able to uh, prove that a certain treatment or protocol uh, is effective, we need a good control condition, similar to what they have in medical um, studies, right? We, we have, all of us uh, are familiar with the placebo uh, condition, okay? So the, the student uh, or the patient has to be believe that he, he receives a, me a medication in medical studies. Here too, in cognitive training, if I won't come up with a condition where students uh, will be uh, engaged in a different uh, activities, and, and I have somehow find a way to convince them that what they are tra that their training is going to help them, okay? Only then, if I'll get the, the results, the predictions uh, I have uh, that shows that my treatment is more beneficial than the other treatment, only then we will be able to say that our treatment, no matter what it is now, is specifically effective for ADHD. This is a, a huge, uh, a, a huge imp important thing to, to uh, be aware of. Because, again, I don't know how it is in Canada, but uh, back home there are so many treatments and, you know, softwares and I don't know what, and EEG and whatever you can, uh, uh, you can dream of. And again, and, and parents and teachers uh, are really, really helpless with finding a solution. Uh, and many of these things are far from being... Um, I'm trying to be, you know... Uh, <laughs> to talk uh, pro appropriately, but this is really devastating, and uh, no, no kidding. Uh, another problem, and this, is the, uh, and this is something, again, I hope now you, uh, you can better evaluate uh, this, this uh, pitfall, that the theoretical framework uh, is, not, is not good. What I mean by uh, uh, theoretical framework, uh, bad theoretical uh, uh, framework, back to what I just mentioned. In order to be able to improve the fun everyday functioning of individuals with ADHD, we have, remember the chain I was, I was referring to? We have to very carefully find the relation between the functional impairments, okay, 
the problems that students with ADHD uh, demonstrate, re the relation between these problems and the cognitive or the neuropsychological mechanisms, okay? And only then uh, we should be able to uh, design our treatment. So if I know that sustained attention is really crucial for reading comprehension, and that sustained attention is one of the most frequent ADHD um, impairments, okay? So now I can perhaps try and design a treatment, a protocol, a cognitive training protocol that will um, train sustained attention. And if I'll be successful, which is a big if, okay, there's a big question mark, if I'll be able to, to train sustained attention in these kids with ADHD that finds it really difficult to, to stay still and to do something for a certain uh, long period of time, then perhaps I'll be able to uh, see uh, what we call transfer, near or far transfer. What I mean by saying transfer is that if indeed I'll be able to improve sustained attention of my students, of our students, then I now uh, hopefully will be able to um, measure improvement in reading and reading comprehension. Are you following my uh, uh, rationale? So that's a very, very big issue. And unfortunately, uh, many of the previous uh, non-pharmacological studies in ADHD uh, didn't do a good job in this sense. Um, another thing, which is uh, uh, not as, as bad as this one, but still, I think, very important, is that the treatment, the cognitive uh, training, should target more than one mechanism. It's not enough uh, uh, to target one mechanism. You can perhaps think why I'm saying that. Why it's not enough to target one cognitive mechanism in the case of ADHD? Remember what I just showed you in the end of the first part, okay? Some of you are nodding. If indeed ADHD is characterized by various, by heterogeneous cognitive deficits, then if I'll train only sustained attention, and half of my, uh, uh, of my sample suffer from uh, cognitive control, or ex what I call uh, executive attention, then my sustained attention training won't help them. You see what I'm saying? So we have to be much more, um, um, much more heterogeneous and much, much more comprehend. Uh, the, the training should be much more um, uh, wide to be able to target the several um, potentially critical cognitive components. Are we okay until now? Okay. Now, let me uh, just introduce uh, very briefly cog the cognitive, several major cognitive training principles. And the reason I'm, I'm doing that is that I truly believe this is something that is uh, possible for you to implement in your everyday uh, teaching or other um, supporting activities. So first of all, cognitive training uh, produces structured and controlled practice. This is very, very important to allow our students to experience uh, these very, very organized, well-planned uh, well uh, practices, okay? And this is something that uh, perhaps you're doing extremely well. Another important principle is um, uh, implementing gradual increase in the level of difficulty. Uh, one of the early uh, findings, I, I remember at least when I just started, uh, uh, when I just uh, started to be interested in the field of ADHD, one of the studies that caught my, my attention was a study uh, from the 90s um, that uh, reported how, how bad it is, I mean, how bad influence it is to uh, give students with ADHD exercises that are e either well above or well below their level of performance, okay? Again, this is something which is, uh, which, which is true for everybody. Uh, so the, the better you synchronize the level of difficulty, the better uh, the chances of your learner to, to learn. 
but, uh, and in uh, cognitive uh, training, this is uh, uh, an important component, to be able to um, measure the improvement of your student and to adjust the changes in the level of difficulty, okay? And to do it gradually, don't, don't make um, big, mis uh, big jumps, uh, and, and again, and don't make too small jumps, because then they, it will be more difficult for us to keep them engaged in, your, in our training. A third principle is, the, uh, uh, is, is the, the key factor of being able to adjust our protocol, our uh, training, to each individual learner. Okay? There's no one suit that suits everybody. We should, we should uh, uh, remember that. And, and this is again something very, very important um, that I think Grégoire also mentioned uh, in the end of your talk uh, earlier today, the, the feedback, okay? He, he t you talked about mistakes. I also believe that the best thing to, to learn is to receive, to be attentive to the feedback we get, okay? And the most informative feedback is when we make mistakes. All right, so remember that, and you can already start think how you can upgrade the feedback you give your students, okay? Not only, well done, oh, you missed it here. That's not enough, okay? We should be able to be very, very precise and informative with the feedback we give to our students and to adjust it to each one of them. No, and, and forget about generic feedbacks. And another important thing is the, uh, the time issue. So one of the problems with learning, with human learning, and generally speaking, is that we get the feedback not online. Okay, think about your students. Think about exams that we take as adults or as children. We get the feedback, the, the external feedback, the formal feedback, uh, away in a, in a very large delay. And then it's really difficult to relate between the, uh, the effort we put and the output of our performance. Okay, so the, the feedback issue, this is, um, 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 as I see it, is a, it's a subject for an entire workshop. Okay, because I really think we can, no, really, not, not, not this time, <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> but I, th I, I truly think this is something, and I think also you referred to it, uh, that this is a, 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 an excellent example where researchers and ed expert teachers and open-minded teachers can really collaborate. Okay, so that's something that I uh, really would like to uh, emphasize. Okay, now, uh, another one-minute reflection. Please write down one example of cognitive training pr principle that you are using intuitively, even if you didn't, you know, call it uh, cognitive training, uh, in your everyday life, not necessarily as teachers, but as human beings. Please write it down. Okay. We shall, we shall uh, continue. All right. So... Um, it's been quite a long time uh, by now that um, uh, we designed a, a CPAT, Computerized Progressive Attention Training. Uh, we designed it uh, over a decade ago to uh, students with ADHD, and this was part of our um, very, big, uh, the very, very, our very uh, initial uh, um, target. Uh, not only to be able to come up with precise uh, attention tools that will allow us to, um, to measure uh, and to produce attention uh, profiles for uh, learners with ADHD, but also to be able to train them. Okay? So the CPAT um, is a theory-driven direct process cognitive training that trains, that targets sustained attention, selective spatial attention, and cognitive control, okay? So we have here three very, very um, um, well-studied uh, components, co cognitive components, that uh, are also uh, uh, reported as being impaired in 
students with ADHD, not only in our studies, but uh, generally speaking. Um, in the CPAT, we implement the principles that I just mentioned before. Uh, and one of them, uh, as I uh, to already told you, is the uh, uh, gradual increasing of the level of difficulty. And this, cha the, the, this gradual uh, change is uh, specific to each individual. So it depends. It's not that I, I the trainer, has to, uh, have to um, decide when to move to one, uh, when to change the level of difficulty, but the program uh, itself uh, decides according to the uh, uh, advancement of the trainees. Um, and an another very, very important thing that I think even now, uh, years later, is still rather unique, is the way the system of feedbacks that we give to our trainees. So first of all, uh, trainees has to achieve a very high level of accuracy. And for kids with ADHD, and not just for them, uh, sometimes it's extremely difficult to be able to uh, inhibit a response and to slow down their responses to be able to uh, respond correct. That's a major, major obstacle uh, that we have to cope uh, with and to um, overcome with kids with ADHD. Uh, and also the feedbacks, and, um, and then if, if the response is correct, then, uh, then we start to uh, give feedbacks for, for uh, speed of processing. Okay? But again, it's not a, um, a matter of uh, yes-no feedback, but more uh, sensitive uh, wh what we're doing in terms of the uh, response times. We compare the um, the response time of the trainee to his or her baseline, and we give feedback, and they they gain uh, they gain their scores uh, according to uh, their previous uh, performance. So if I was accurate but uh, slow relative relative to myself, then the point accumulation will be uh, not as high as uh, as I could. If I uh, I am correct and my speed of processing is average compared to my baseline, then I'll get more points. But if I'll be uh, both correct and relatively fast, then the accumulation of points will be uh, faster. Okay? Uh, now, we have all sorts of uh, feedbacks, I mean, different sorts of feedback in our program. First of all, we have the online feedback. So if I'm not only the, if I'm wrong, yes or not, but also uh, if I was fast enough or relatively fast. So the kids get online feedbacks. Uh, but this is true for all tasks, all training tasks, expect, except the uh, uh, sustained attention task. Because there, with sustained attention, if I'll give my trainees feedback, then I will uh, reduce the need for sustained attention, uh, and this is why sustained attention with kids with ADHD, perhaps it's the most difficult attention function to train. We'll elaborate it uh, a little bit uh, later on. And here you have a, a, an, um, an example of feedback that we give uh, by the end of a series of, uh, of trials, okay? Like a block of uh, 40 trials or, or 80 uh, trials of, uh, of, of one training task. So you can see the numbers, and never mind the details, but uh, the kids get the number of uh, correct responses, number of well done. Uh, these are the trials where they were faster than before, etc., etc. So that's the informative feedback I was referring to earlier. Okay, so it's not only the number of points and whether or not uh, they broke their record, but uh, more. Um, um, precise information and more informative information. Oh, sorry, I'm mixing it up. And here you can see another uh, sort of feedback, but this feedback is um, something that uh, we show the trainees once every uh, four sessions, uh, four training sessions. Uh, actually, in the beginning, it was 
It was, uh, we, we did it uh, for the trainers, but then very, very, um, very fast we, uh, we found out that the kids really, really uh, gained a lot of uh, motivation uh, from uh, uh, seeing these graphs. This is reaction time, so this means uh, they got better. Okay, the training improved his uh, reaction times, and the same here, this is standard deviation, so the fluctuation in reaction time. This is again one of the major problems of children with ADHD to be consistent in their performance. So here you, you, ca you can really see a very nice level of uh, accuracy and um, a simultaneously improvement in reaction time and imp huge improvement in uh, 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 sustain attention in the consistency of performance. Uh, now we're going to uh, experience briefly, okay, several uh, training tasks together. So let's see if I can uh, work it out. Okay. So what we're going to, to uh, experience now is, uh, oops, what should I do here? Con uh, Windows B, was it? Yes. To see it? Hmm? Ah, duplicate, du duplicate we need, right. And now, okay. And what about lights? Is this the way we're going to do it? Um, well, ah, that's okay, it will be, sorry, my mistake. Okay, so that's a training task for selective spatial attention. That, uh, who was the one who asked about selective uh, spatial, atten uh, spatial attention? So you see, the, um, you see here above, this is the target, you see here? And these are the distractors, and your task, listen carefully, folk, be, be, uh, let's concentrate. <laughs> Uh, so, if you find the target, this guy here, you're going to raise your right hand. If you won't find it, him, you'll raise your left hand. Okay? I'm reminding you that this is the target. Okay? These guys are distractors. So, if you won't find this little guy with a gray, can you? See, you'll see it better because it will be on a white background. So, don't worry. Um, so, this is the target. Okay? This guy, right, right hand, if you can't find him, left hand. All right? Let's start. Oops. Can you see him? Right. Is he there? You, you, I, I uh, mistake, no, j just a minute. <laughs> I, I pressed uh, uh, the wrong button just to uh, remind you that when we, when we, the trainees, make a mistake, they, c they hear a feedback, okay? Uh, um, auditory feedback. Okay, so that's another one. Can you, s can you find him? Okay. Is he there? Is he there? Come on. Now that you are a bit more familiar with the task, try to be as still accurate, but as fast as you can, okay? Let's go for it. Accurate, but fast. Whoops. <laughs> Not too fast, all right? Okay? <laughs> yes, when he's somewhere in the periphery, this is much more tricky. All right. Good. Um, let's have another. Okay, so that was a, a, a very brief uh, example of selective spatial attention. You you, we couldn't see the we couldn't see the online feedback because uh, because it's not a real trainee. What we gener what we usually do the kids uh, before everything else they have to reach a very high accuracy level. And, only, and then the only thing that matters is accuracy, okay? And this is, the, this is the stage where some of them find it really, really difficult because they have to re uh, repeat again and again. Thank you. Okay, I'll um, go out of this and go back to here. Okay, so, ah, sorry about that. And this was, uh, I just, uh, um, 
demonstrated one of the training tasks, but we have uh, for each one of the attention function different, atten uh, different uh, training tasks with gradual um, uh, increase of uh, the level of difficulties. Um, okay, so here you see our original study that is uh, already uh, back in 2007, as you can see uh, down there. And uh, what, we, oops, what we had there is uh, we compared the children who uh, underwent attention training. It's a, it was a protocol of 16, only 16 sessions of one hour, twice a week. And we compared them to uh, the control uh, training group who uh, underwent a combination of computerized uh, games, standard games, and paper and pencil uh, activities. And you can see here uh, the results. We got uh, nice interactions and uh, in passage copying and in reading comprehension, the attention training uh, group performed, uh, uh, demonstrated a significant uh, improvement after the training, uh, as opposed to the uh, control training group. You can see it here. And this was also uh, a similar uh, interaction was obtained with inattention, you see here, inattention symptoms, the CPAD group, uh, decrease. These these are uh, evaluations of their parents who were blind to the to the group there that they uh, participated in, and you can see here that there was no improvement in the uh, control training group. With hyperactivity, the interaction was not uh, was not significant. So what we got back then in our original study was a nice far transfer. Okay, remember what I said earlier, because as you, you just tasted, we didn't do anything with them that was related to reading or writing or math, okay? We just, we just had this very, very simple attention task, okay? Using the, uh, uh, these feedbacks and the, and the uh, cognitive training principles. Um, now, importantly, since then, we were, not only us, also other groups that uh, worked with our, our CPAT. Uh, so, luckily, we were, um, uh, we were able to replicate uh, similar results with other groups, uh, clinical groups that uh, suffer from attention uh, problems. Um, you can see here children with fetal alcohol syndrome, stroke patients, patients that uh, uh, suffered from uh, brain lesions uh, in, uh, in uh, attention areas. Uh, also, recently we replicated it with higher education students, the very same program, although it was planned for children. Student, higher education students with ADHD actually showed very, very nice uh, sustained attention improvements. Uh, and uh, more recently, even children with autism spectrum disorder, which was a complete surprise for me, uh, because I think uh, the attention issues there are completely different, uh, yet uh, we were able to replicate, again, far transfer effects that I find really, really surprising and encouraging. So generally speaking, wrapping it up together, uh, we are able and we still do uh, conduct uh, other studies um, in order to um, consolidate and to replicate our ability of near and far trans transfer effects um, as a result of the CPAT. Um, now, how I am uh, time-wise? Okay. So I'll mention now a new protocol. Uh, this is the PhD study of uh, Inbar uh, Trinzer from a PhD candidate uh, from my lab. And uh, Inbar uh, really wanted to uh, take the CPAT and adjust it or translate it to small group uh, setting. Because it's you know it's one-to-one -one training. This is really really difficult, especially if you think about uh, school settings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, what she has done, she came up with a module. She in, she introduced a new module of group activities, uh, um, focusing on social uh, interaction, on uh, giving feedback to one another, on sharing our uh, the kids' difficulties, etc., etc. Et 
Um, this is a very, very difficult uh, um, study to conduct, but again, uh, we, we believe in, uh, in cognitive training, so we did this effort. So Inbar had uh, her, her, actually she compared two protocols. Uh, one is the group CPAT training, so this is this one here attention training protocol, but for small groups. And uh, her other group was uh, a group that uh, uh, completed the protocol of executive functions uh, training, which is really, really uh, very close to our CPAT. And also she had a passive control uh, group that these kids came to the lab in the pre-test, in the post-test, and also in the follow-up that was conducted uh, four months after the end of the training. Um, as I just said, it is extremely implicated study. You can see how the children... This study was conducted in, the, in campus, so they came to the... Uh, uh, to the School of Education at Tel Aviv University. It's, it means that it's, it's extremely um, demanding both for us and for the parents and the families. Uh, I should mention that. And also, an important thing is that um, uh, INBAR designed new, two new training tasks to, uh, to, come up to try and cope with the thing we uh, learned earlier in our studies, that for young children with ADHD, it is very, very um, challenging to uh, improve sustained attention. So what she's done, she, uh, we, we shortened the tasks of sustained attention, and, uh, and we think, okay, I won't say what we think, I'll show you. Uh, so I again, it's the same thing, the new tasks um, targeting sustained attention in a uh, different way perhaps more adjusted to young kids with ADHD. And she also um, added an, another task of inhibition of a prepotent response, which is a go-no-go -no -go task, training task. Uh, and the same, um, the same cognitive principles, increasing level of difficulty, uh, informative uh, feedbacks uh, um, as before. Uh, now the, the, the tasks look a bit more um, up to date, because what I've just uh, demonstrated, this is really very, very old, uh, and it is apparent. And this is an example of the um, executive functions training. So we trained, we focus on planning, problem solving, spatial working memory, and response inhibition. So you can see that planning, problem solving, and spatial working memory are uh, components that are uh, different from our attention, uh, train, uh, our CPET, original CPET. Uh, and the, the reason we've done that is that we hoped, or we, um, uh, our prediction was that we will be able to come up with differential effects. So the CPET were expected to improve attention, and the executive uh, function uh, protocol uh, group was expected to improve working memory, planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, here are, I suppose you are familiar with these uh, tasks, sets, and if not, I highly recommend this uh, game, set. If you want, I'll, uh, you can come afterwards and I'll have a word with you about that. And see, uh, these, these um, uh, in Bar's dissertation is still she's still analyzing the data. We have huge number of um, huge amount of data, and this is the sustained attention um, results. So uh, again, the kids were evaluated pre-intervention, post-intervention, and there's also uh, a follow-up um, um, assessment. And you can see here uh, these are. The, the CPA, the AT is the attention training kids. You see here, this is sustained attention, standard deviation of reaction time. So again, a de decrease means a better performance. It means they manage to be more consistent in the boring task that measures sustained attention. And you can see that both other groups, both the uh, executive functions uh, protocol and the passive control uh, in these groups, uh, um, participants decreased 
And this is not a huge surprise because the task is really, really uh, very boring. And the second time that you do it, you know what to expect. So actually, here, this is a very, very uh, encouraging result that children with uh, ADHD um, that uh, completed the CPAT protocol managed to improve their sustained attention. And actually, I don't have it here because we don't, I don't, we, she didn't do the analysis yet, uh, but we do know that uh, in the follow-up, they were stu still improving. So that what the improvement was maintained. Um, so that's another measure of sustained attention, omission errors, the number of uh, times that they, uh, they missed the target. Again, the very, same, uh, the very same pattern of responses. So this is really, really um, uh, encouraging. All right, so now, right now, what I'd like you to do, that's the last uh, one minute reflection. Please uh, try to think about at least one way that you can implement one of the principles of cognitive training that, we, uh, that I uh, described earlier in your work, uh, either when you think about classwork or activities outside the class, please uh, think about it for a minute and write down uh, one ID, one or two IDs before we, we will finish our... I, I'll finish my presentation. Okay, let's continue. And I know, uh, I know uh, I'm, I'll now finish in, in a couple of uh, minutes or so. So what I'd like to do, I uh, prepared a list of recommendations for you um, and uh, your students. We'll start with one example, with a sustained attention uh, uh, example. And if you'd like, I mean, in the presentation, there are also uh, recommendations for the other functions, and uh, I'll be happy to share with you the presentation uh, uh, later on. And also, if you'll have questions, I'll be, I mean, after the time for questions in, in here, I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to have a word with whoever is interested in this. Okay, so sustained attention. I'm starting with it because this is indeed the most frequent impaired attention functions, and again, uh, not only for kids with ADHD, but also for others. There are many, many of us that find it really difficult to stay focused, uh, especially when they cannot respond uh, uh, whenever they'd like to. So, uh, here there are several uh, recommendations. First of all, uh, try to um, better structure uh, the activities you are using, um, and also try to implement, uh, insert, relatively short, um, sh sh sorry, short breaks between the uh, different periods of time. So in this way, you'll be uh, able to improve, or, or let's put it differently, if we'll use relatively short uh, learning time or working uh, period of time and insert short breaks, then also, even the learners with poor sustained attention will be much more attentive uh, while they're, they're doing their work. Okay, so that's one important uh, option. And don't worry, I always tell teachers uh, or parents or whoever, don't worry to start with really short period of time. That's, that's not a problem because gradually, the, our, our main aim here is to give our students the, the sense of effectiveness, of being able to, uh, to learn effectively. And this is a very, very important aim. As soon as they'll, as they'll see that they are uh, successful, uh, you'll start to see the, the improvement, and very gradually you'll be able to, uh, to, to uh, um, increase the period of time. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing that we, uh, I mentioned earlier is the feedback. So here, too, when you spot a student that um, uh, presents lapses of attention uh, or distracted to another, what's going on uh, in the background, etc., etc., uh, try to give him or her a feedback that you'll talk, I mean, but let him know that this is the meaning of the feedback without embarrassing him or her in the classroom. Okay, um, 
Okay, and this one here, down here, this is also a very important thing. Try to refrain from very monotonous tasks that uh, that are passive or relatively passive for the learner. Try to come up with activities that will engage your students in the task you are doing, and, and in this way, again, you'll decrease the demands of sustained attention. So these things are not, tr uh, uh, let's put it, uh, uh, let's, let's uh, spell it out. These are not um, strategies that will improve your students sustain attention, but it will, it will allow them to better uh, attend to the uh, learning activity. So this is a, an example of adjustment of the learning environment and le le learning uh, uh, materials to your students' uh, abilities. I should stop here, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just... Just a minute. Okay, so I'll put it there. And I'll be ready for your questions.